lessons for modern resilience is also a gift to our military. So thank you, Nancy, for um, coming back to the Naval Academy, where you're always so welcome. Awesome. Thank you. And coming to discuss your latest book. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Well, it is truly a pleasure. Um, and you can blame me, not Ed or others, for any 203. <laughs> um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about Stoic Wisdom, uh, the book, um, which looks like that. Uh, but I wanted to say it got its animus, or Stoic Warriors did, and this is a bit of a follow-on, um, by being here, where I was thinking a, a lot about suck it up and truck on, that kind of mantra, or a more inelegant, embrace the suck. And I really wanted to know if ancient Stoicism had more to say than that. Uh, I am a, I, I study ancient philosophy, uh, I also study the emotions um, and of some psychotherapeutic background of research training, at least in psychoanalysis. So I really uh, wanted to explore Stoicism, and in part very practically, because I've been involved with uh, the Army and other uh, branches trying to destigmatize mental health, suicide prevention. Um, and moral injury, the, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. So this wasn't just a, uh, an academic <laughs> venture. It really is part of who I am and my professional commitment. Suck it up ran really against everything I wanted to think about. So um, let, me, let me begin by trying to deflate some uh, myths, maybe, uh, that come uh, into being about Stoicism. One is that if you're stoic, you have a stiff upper lip. That you know, may be British, uh, actually it may be an American phrase, early 19th century. But the idea being that you don't have any emotions. And so let's just sort of think about who the founders were. The three Greek founders were, these are not household names. Zeno of Kidium, not the guy with the tortoise and the hair. Um, that's a different Zeno. Uh, a guy named Chrysippus and another Cleantes, uh, but then also the more familiar um, uh, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, and Seneca, who's my favorite. Uh, they were not, these guys were not intent on draining us of emotions, suppressing our emotional uh, comportments, etc. And I think that distorts the text, and it also distorts the text to think that we don't use emotions to connect with each other. So um, the Stoics were cognitivists with respect to the emotions. Uh, that is, they believed in emotions as having uh, evaluative cognitions. And, uh, but before you get to that level, there's a basic level. And the basic level is essentially things you know very well. Starts and startles, quick responses, adaptive uh, response to threat, knowing the sounds and signals. And you don't always give assent to them, uh, but you sort of know how to react. And so Seneca says, for example, uh, you know, they can be adaptive and part of survival. And then actually, let me just jump ahead. Uh, um, Joe, Joe Ledoux, he's a uh, rather famed neurobiologist at NYU, he calls them fast track emotions, fast road emotions. They kind of go from this part of your brain, the lower stem, right, right up and help you. And so Seneca has an early version of this. And if you read Seneca's um, great piece on anger, he says, even the bravest man often turns pale as he puts on his armor. The knees of even the fiercest soldier tremble a little as a signal is given for battle. Uh, a general's heart is in his mouth before the lines have charged against one another. A military man in civilian clothes pricks up his ears at the sound of a trumpet. And so he dubs these often fortuitous mental impulses, meaning, I suspect, not all of them are adaptive, some are. They happen without control. Now, another, if you, if you give in to them when they're not so adaptive, they get you in trouble. They derail you. Anger can derail you. Too much fear can derail you. Um, grief, chronic grief, uh, unabated chronic grief of loss, of accident, of blunders, 
um, all that can derail you. And so the Stoics are interested in figuring out how do you manage them. And so they want to suggest you have to learn a new kind of approach or avoidance behavior. So it's not, they want you to eventually get to a point where you have rational emotions. Um, you don't suspend all your emotions, but you have a certain kind of uh, rational desire, rational caution, wary caution, we might say, um, a, a way of facing loss that isn't totally debilitating. And they think this um, in the sense of that you have to figure out a way of having emotions where they're not sticky and acquisitive, where you just don't want to hold on to the object of desire, or in the case of, of fear, have panicky aversion. So what they're interesting in, or with regard to, is figuring out how we develop these new strategies for what I think of as approach avoidance behavior. Now, <coughs> um, the one kind of emotion I just want to pause over is distress. Of late, and in my own work and many others, we speak about moral distress or moral injury. And so, and I've written a lot on this, and moral injury is, is a trauma response when it's severe. It's, it's really a trauma response to severe moral conflict or challenge. It's related to PTS, PTSD, post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress, if you want to put the D on it, disorders, um, with overlapping sim symptoms, come on in, yet distinct in that it's a moral threat and not a fear threat. So we think of PTSD as really, uh, the trigger is, is a, 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 a over-responsive hypervigilance, perhaps, um, or breaches of safety, whereas in the case of moral injury, it's breaches of morality. You thought you could have done more to save someone. You thought you could have had a smoother evacuation to think about what's going on right now in Afghanistan. Um, and they're testaments to the fact that we hold ourselves responsible, that there's agency. Um, yet, they can be devastating. And so the, 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 the Stoics don't want to fully eradicate that aspect of your moral accountability in the way it shows. But whether you call it accident guilt, or you call it luck guilt, or you call it survivor guilt, or you call it uh, the funk that you're in when you could have and should have done something differently. But rather, they acknowledge that it can be too harsh. It can be unfair, we might say. The burden can be unfair. And here, I want to just point to a play we don't typically think of as part of the corpus when we read Stoics, and that's Seneca's play, Hercules Rages. So Hercules, this mighty guy, finishes his 12 labors, and he bursts through Hades into the real world, and he can't wait for the homecoming, really, you know, a homecoming for his wife, with his wife and family. But Juno, his sort of evil stepmother, married to Zeus, um, but always, always jealous of Hercules, because he's Hercules, um, and he came by through a different mother, <laughs> um, she blinds him, and she makes him crazy. And so when he comes into this world, he unwittingly, this is tragedy like Greek tragedy, he unwittingly kills his family. When he comes to, out of the stupor, all he wants to do is commit suicide. It was his hand that did it. And so there were could'ves and should'ves and horrible, horrible guilt. Now, it's his father that says, with, with compassion, the grief is yours, but the guilt is your stepmother's. Bad luck is not your fault. And his best friend says to him, Use your heroic courage to show mercy to yourself. That's amazing to me. I mean, you don't think of that as a stoic lesson. If anything, you think grit, go it on your own. This is not going on your own. In fact, it's a VA protocol. Veterans uh, 
administration protocol where you try to turn to others to be able to take up their perspective to be able to show yourself some mercy or some self-compassion. They wouldn't hold you as accountable as you sometimes hold yourself. That's a stoic lesson I think we don't often think about. And it's where we think about what I think of is it's resilience or grit built by the sustenance of others, the compassion of others. It's part of a cadre, really. <coughs> OK, that takes us to another myth. And that is, um, sometimes we think of stoicism as just uh, self-help. That's in the, that Ed and I were, Dr. Barrett and I were talking about, that's in the air these days. Um, it's a way of, it's a, if it's not a diet book, it's a kind of book you can get in the airport for those of us that go to airports and, uh, um, during the pandemic. And it's a way of finding, uh, steering a course when you feel like you've, you're a bit rudderless. If you're in Silicon Valley, you might call them life hacks. Um, you know, a way of uh, cobbling together uh, a workaround is what a life hack essentially is. Um, now, the Stoics, or Stoic-like Epictetus, did promise athletic training for the soul, and that's part of the appeal. It's tough, tough discipline. But it's moral discipline. It's not just about me. It's about us. It's our good. Social selves connected locally and globally. And so Marcus Aurelius, uh, Roman emperor, and uh, leading the battle, the Germanic campaigns along the Danube in about 180, common era. Um, he has this very graphic image. And when I read this, I think he's got the battlefield on his mind. He's writing this in the wee hours of the morning. The troops may have been on booze of some sort or you know, things to help soothe their, um, their pains. But he says, when if you've ever seen a hand or, a, a, or an arm, a leg severed from the rest of the body, that's what a person makes of himself when he cuts himself off from the rest of humanity. Um, and so the idea is that we flourish only when we act cooperatively and at times selflessly. And so they have this idea developed uh, from one of their predecessors, the founder of cynicism, Diogenes the Cynic, of cosmopolitanism. We are citizens, polites, of the cosmos, of the, of the universe. So it, it's a global reach which had great uh, reach into the Enlightenment and the idea that we're all connected through humanity. We're global citizens. A citizen of everywhere and nowhere is how Diogenes the Cynic put it. And they offer a visualization practice. Uh, again, showing you that this is about connection, and the idea is it, it, it's a little bit like Peter Singer's expanding the circles inward. Imagine yourself at the center. You bring the most outer circle of the universe inward, and you try to make the outer circle kith and kin. You know, it's a visualization practice. It can happen without a lot of work. Uh, do it with zeal and a moral commitment. Uh, this lesser known Stoic Heracles says, but it's, a, it's an idea we all often think of, of how to make us, how to make them us, how to uh, expand the circle and bring it to the self. There's an idea of this also in the Republic, in Plato's Republic, Book 5. Okay, so you're essentially expanding, as Singer, Peter Singer might put it, the contemporary philosopher. Expa uh, there are many Peter Singers, not P.W. Singer, but Peter Singer, who may be at Princeton still, um, expanding the circle of moral concern. So what about this idea that the Stoics have of indifference? This gets them into trouble. It's a crappy word. But the idea is not, you know, the Stoics famously uh, want to uh, draw a line between what's in your control and what's outside. That's how you minimize vulnerability. And for many Stoic practitioners, the mindset is change your attitude, don't think you can change the external world. It's a little bit like accept and acquiesce. And that's how many read Epictetus when he says it's not events that disturb people, it's your interpretations of them, your assessments or your estimates of them. Now, I argue in Stoic Wisdom, in the book, that the very tools that can put a buffer between the outer world and our spin on it 
are the same ones that can help us change the outer world for the better. We see through personal biases we don't even know we have. Philosophers call it epistemic standpoints. Um, and the Stoics actually offer techniques for slowing down impulsive thinking that can cloud our judgment. And so Seneca puts it this way. Uh, he says, we can insert attention and will and monitor impulsive impressions and the quick bodily responses that follow. We can nip them in the bud before we yield to them in irrational ways. Because if we start yielding, he says, and we, we give in to the full impulse of impetuous emotions, it's a little bit like you're standing on a precipice and you fall off. You can't, once, once in motion, you can't turn back. Or it's a little bit like a runner in full stride. If you're in full stride, you can't stop on a dime. You, you've, you've got the impulse, the impetus is with you forward and forward motion. And so the claim is that you somehow monitor your attention so that you see what's coming in and don't always immediately impulsively react to the input. Can't always do that, but the idea is to somehow practice that. Um, and he says that's what it is to uh, live in accord with nature. And so you want to somehow also monitor the distortions. They have a very strange view of distortions. Um, but the idea is you want to try to see what's out there that's consistent with virtue and, uh, your, and your best. So on my view, that's an engagement in the world. It's not a retreat from it. It's an engagement in the world in that you're seeing how you're spinning the world, how you see the world. Um, and so um, they have a term for this. And that is um, the externals in the world that, you're, uh, that, that give you sensory input, and especially that you want to have, like wealth or power or glory or success, mm -hmm. successful outcomes. Um, they say, unlike Aristotle, they're not just externals that are part of your happiness. That would, that's Aristotle's view. They say they are indifference. So that doesn't mean you're apathetic to them or indifferent. It means that they don't make a difference to your happiness. Now, that is a hard pill to swallow. It's really hard to swallow. But the way to think about it is that you can still, on their view, prefer or disprefer. It's a little bit like an economist's language. They're preferences. You can still prefer or disprefer, promote or demote. But you, and they matter to. Uh, you want health over disease. You want a successful campaign over a bungled one. But by talking about the language of preference or dispreference, they don't make or break your happiness. It's again hard. But the idea is not only that you recalibrate your value, so what matters is your virtue and not all the externals, but that you recalibrate your approach and avoidance behavior. You kind of, you prefer it, but you don't, you don't cling to it with sticky attachment. You disprefer it, but you don't, uh, the aversion isn't so strong that, if, it, that, that it, if things don't go your way, you, that's the end of the world. So it's a, it's a, it's a cognitive behavioral therapy of philosophy. You both revalue what's out there and you learn approach avoidance behavior, which is what, uh, what behavioral modification is, so that you are a little bit more tamed or tempered with respect to things you want to have, outcomes you zealously want. They also have this idea of mental reservation that you say of outcomes you want, you know, I'll, uh, the campaign will be successful unless something happens. It's a Hedge your bets. It's a cushion. Now, it doesn't mean you give up, but I was just reading Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, and I was saying, that's something I've read. Before. I was, went back as I remembered that it opens, this amazing book, To the Lighthouse. It opens with this remarks. This little six-year-old says, uh, well, or, or his mother says to him to try to assuage or calm him down a little bit. They're in the Hebrides in Scotland and Skye, the Isle of Skye. 
we will go to the lighthouse if it doesn't rain. <laughs> That's a big if. But for, it's a way of putting in your mind a little flexibility as opposed to rigidity. And that's what the Stoics are about. They're about nimbleness, adaptiveness, so you're not stuck. They think of resilience as agility and how you can change plans. Now, if you're a sage, you're supposed to think in advance, so you're all, you know what's happening, and you, you know, if, if the world's changing this way or that way, if the world, if the world somehow thinks that you, you should have your foot muddy, says Epictetus, then your foot shouldn't be clean, it should be muddy. If, it, if somehow you think, you know, in this case, Nero says it's your time, uh, I'm sorry, the end is near, then even though you like life, you might switch to, uh, uh, to a different kind of preference. But that's the idea. It's a sort of nimbleness, agility, without getting stuck and having to have it. So it's not compulsiveness, which I think we all need a, a dose of. <laughs> all right. So... Not surprisingly, the founders of cognitive behavioral therapy, Aaron Beck and, and Albert Ellis in the 60s, turned to Stoicism as a way of, or at least informing, uh, inspiring their views. But what I want to emphasize is you are trafficking in the world. You're not re re retreating, acquiescing, accepting anything goes. That is not Stoicism on my view. And so we're in the messy world, trying to figure out how to live in that world with calm, agility, and a dedication to virtue. I think that's the lesson of the, the best of the Stoics. A myth. Stoicism is only about manliness. It's a misogynistic philosophy. Now, there are a lot of toxic sites online that would suggest that. And I went down some of those rabbit holes to, in, when I was doing research. A kind of hyper-masculine ideology, um, uh, red pill sub, uh, subreddits. And, uh, and here Donna Zuckerberg has written a book, not all, not all White Men, I think is what it's called, 2018. She's a classicist. Um, and the, the claim reverberates in some echo chambers. Um, that manly character is the heart of virtue and women are not uh, eligible or part of the crowd. And so the ancient world, you know, whenever you do history, you have to understand that we are, it is, you, you can't take your glasses off. You're, you're in your world looking at an ancient culture. That's sort of how I view it. And so it may not have been a place for modern gender equity by any means or a place for liberation. They definitely had enslaved persons um, and the retinue of, or you know, a retinue of servants uh, would make Downton Abbey, Abbey, excuse me, <laughs> look, <laughs> look, look skimpy, shabby. But the Stoic philosophers in their discourses on political and moral life held that virtue or ethical excellence, that's really what the term virtue means from the Greek, ethical arete, excellence, had no gender. And so the founder, this, again, Zeno, Zeno of Kidium, um, envisaged an ideal community of sages that included women. And that follows from the Stoic view that humans are endowed with reason and are thus all capable of aspiring to, to virtue, which emerges out of reason. So it's very much an enlightenment idea, as you can hear, that it's no surprise that uh, Manuel Kant came to read them. I mean, this was popular reading uh, throughout most of the Renaissance and, and Enlightenment period. And so if it were up to the Stoics, maybe uh, USNA would have gone co-ed, not in 1976, but well before that. So they, they believed that this had implications for both girls and boys. Now, Epictetus' teacher was a guy named Musonius Rufus, not a household name and partly because he hasn't been well translated and, um, or easily translated, um, though there is a good translation that Martha Nussbaum did at some point. And he insisted that women should study and practice philosophy just as men do, for they have, quote, received from the gods the same rational faculty as men. 
And they also share with men, he went on to argue, a desire, so not just a capacity, but a desire for ethical excellence, for virtue. And moreover, he added a natural orientation to it. So that's an important point. Uh, being spoke, you know, be writing in first century common era of Rome. So the Stoics, uh, I don't think, are putting forth a misogynistic philosophy, though they have been interpreted that way. Um, and many of the leading scholars of, uh, of, of Stoicism are, in fact, women, contem my contemporaries. Now, the Stoics are interesting to many of us because of the meditation techniques. And another, I think, misapprehension is, oh, they're just like uh, Eastern style. But they're really not. So Eastern meditation, and I'm, I'm no expert in uh, Buddhism or Hinduism or other variations, though I do meditate in the morning in a more Eastern style, are about clearing your head. Stop the babble. Don't argue with yourself. Let it go. Just calm the discourse. So don't be litigious with yourself. But the Stoic meditation is actually quite different. So one thing you're supposed to do is pre-rehearse or anticipate ills so they don't blindsight you. Go small, you break a jug, eh. Go bigger, it's going to be really noisy at the gym or the pool, something I always think about. Don't worry about it too much. The public baths, they're thinking Roman public bathhouses in Rome, it's going to be OK. The third, death. So a homespun example, my mother would never talk about death, 97 and still not talking about death. <laughs> and I'm in charge of her care. What are we going to do? So I would visit her at the nursing home. And so I decided I had a game with her mom or joke. You know, if we're paying for the immortality plan, it is going to be really expensive. <laughs> this guy you know, got a rise out of her, and it became our little dance. You know, remind me, did we, did we sign up for the immortality plan? So we kind of together got into it. You know, she had a peaceful death. Uh, um, but I, I think we prepared ourselves. That's the stoic idea. Don't avoid it. Think about things in advance. And there actually, I just want to mention, there's an important, uh, the IDF, Israeli Defense Force, in conjunction with Walter Reed, and, and also NIH here. Uh, I live right near those two places, NIH and Walter Reed. They um, have a protocol they've been working on, which is essentially not just uh, uh, anticipate uh, hypervigilance in advance, so pre-exposure therapy. We often think of prolonged exposure therapy after PTSD, but sometimes it's pre. You, you, you do in vivo you know, drills to see what, what, uh, what threats and real risks look like. But in addition, they, through computerization, they try to monitor attention so that the bias isn't just to threat or risk, but also to neutral stimuli, so that you have an alternative. So that you, so I mean, because you worry with pre-rehearsing ills, oh, the Stoics are pre-traumatizing everyone. Uh, you know, I sometimes think about this. This isn't such a hot idea. You're always thinking that your kid could die tomorrow. Kiss your child goodbye as if it were the last time. That's pretty, you know, my students think, whoo, you know, my parents are so morbid all the time. So, <laughs> so if rather you also have this alternative, an alternative groove that isn't just risk, attention bias to risk, but, it, but some alternative that, you're, that you can flip, the, the idea, uh, excuse me, Israeli Defense Force, has had some success. These are small samples, but it's an interesting spin on the idea, I think. All right, another um, thing I mentioned was mental reservation. You sort of couch your, uh, your intentions unless it doesn't happen. Says, says Seneca, I'll go for a boat ride unless it rains. And so it's a little bit like uh, financial brochures. Past performance isn't a, a guarantee of future, of future performance, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's meditation at the end of the day. And that's very discursive. And Seneca is pretty um, familiar. You know, like, think about uh, 
were you, you didn't get seated at the dais. You had, you know, and you're pissed off because you should have been there. You were a little angry with other people, and so on. And so it's a little bit like calm your, uh, think of your foibles and prepare yourself for tomorrow. So I see people are. It's it's sort of. Um, I'll just end on a, a, a light note and then please open it up to Q&A. Sound good? Um, Carl Reiner is, is called by uh, Steve Martin the day before a shoot and says, am I bothering you? Steve, Steve says, am I bothering you? Carl says, no, I'm just lying here awake going through my litany of failures. That's a little bit like Seneca sometimes. It can be a bit soul searching and so sometimes with stoicism stoic meditation it might not be a bad idea to have temperate a little bit with uh go easy on yourself meditation as well <laughs> so i'm going to stop there um i wish i could see your faces you get a quick glance of mine and floor is open for you i'd love to hear your questions i know you got some so fire away as as time allows yeah please Oh, my pleasure. Um, my first question would be, you talked about moral injury, uh -huh. the hurt of forgiving yourself. Uh -huh. Would you say the same? Um, I mean, you talked about moral injury in terms of survival skills and mm -hmm. stuff like this. Would you say the same about Sorry. moral injury concerning um, things that people did wrong, for example, war crimes? So if someone did war crimes and kind of never forgave them, since himself or herself for that, do you think they question. should have the courage to, to forgive themselves? That's a great do you question. Think they should probably that they are free about their actions to sort of their eternal punishment that they might deserve. That's a hard question, boy. Um, A lot of the conversation with moral injury is about uh, accidents as opposed to uh, sin, if you like, um, co real transgressions. Uh, so apparent transgressions as opposed to real. I suspect there are ways of forgiving and there are, co there are forms of penance and, what, what, and community engagement. And that at some point, needs to be the way forward. I mean, this is, uh, I'm not, this is extrajudicial, whatever happens uh, through war crime tribunals uh, and the like. But there are lots of forms, in addition to all that, there are critical aspects of bringing s individuals back into communities who've been pariahs, uh, forms of, of community service. I mean, you're, so, Th these are huge questions. Martha Minow uh, at Harvard Law has written a little bit about South African um, tribunals in this regard, and so that's a place to go. Uh, and I don't know the data on the re recommunication, but yeah, only, uh, only unflat unfailing self-punishment can't be a way forward, but there also, you know, there has to be public punishment in addition to uh, a community um, sources of comfort. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Complicated question. Yeah, please. You mentioned the, the free Trump, free exposure. Yeah. And the, the IDF. Yeah. This, so definitely, this is sort of a flip side of that. It's not just training of the risks and simulations um, and uh, reading the signs and you know, signals, that sort of thing, or you know, in the extreme case, um, Sears training. Um, but this is also trying to get the brain to find patterns of neutral stimuli so that after war, PTSD is reduced. So the hyper the over the overstimulated response, the overstimulated fear conditioning response, which is one way of thinking about post-traumatic stress, is mitigated because there's another track for attending to more neutral stimuli. I mean, I've just sort of read a little bit of this that came to me through a neurobiologist. 
Um, and the sample sizes are very small. Um, but that, that, that is about the extent of uh, my understanding. But I will just say this. Fear conditioning um, of the sort that I was just talking about doesn't really, or, or after prolonged exposure therapies before or after, don't really address moral injury. Moral injury is not specifically about fear. I mean, there's going to be similar stuff going on of nightmares and um, could haves and should haves and you know hindsight bias and and enormous uh, uh, disappointment, et cetera. But specifically, the idea is either agent transgression, you did something wrong, victim trans vic being transgressed as a victim, or uh, think of, I think of a lot of the war journalists I know, some of whom were are Marines um, who've been there, done it, and now they're watching it up close. So as as a witness. And deconditioning your fear, I, I, I think someone like Bill Nash, who's a, a Navy, actually a, a Navy psychiatrist, retired captain, who works, has worked a long time with Marines, I mean, he's adamant that prolonged exposure therapy does not work for moral injury. That's his uh, claim, those are his claims, from a, from a data point of view. Yeah, um, one, Dr. yeah, thank you. <laughs> I can't answer that. God could be is probably Zeus. So it, it's we're taught with this Roman mythological world, but the, their view is that that uh, divine source infuses the whole cosmos, and we are somehow tr supposed to be in sync with it. Um, but not surprisingly, they come into, the Stoics are writing around the time of Judeo-Christianity. So it's not surprising that a lot of Stoicism sounds familiar to us because it gets absorbed. We're talking the cusp of the millennium, you know? So that, so, but you know, and then we move to a monotheistic, uh, at least in, in the case of the Islamic, uh, Abra uh, Abraham, the Abrahamic and you know, Christian views, that's how it moves. Thank you, though. Thank you. There were some questions right here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I guess sort of my question, um, you know, I think about the relationship between like Stoics and Kant, for example. Is it seems like Kant, if you're trying to describe what, is that he seems to, I think he's sort of is attracted to Stoic psychology in a lot of ways, but thinks that ultimately you have to have some kind of prior grounding for independent moral judgments or else it goes awry. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I was mm -hmm. thinking about this with nimbleness, mm -hmm. right? So nimbleness is an attractive feature in people's psychology, indexed to certain kinds, the value of the project that you're, a that you're willing to abandon or something like that, right? So there's a sense in which you can be too willing to abandon a project in the face of things outside of your control or, you know, or not willing enough. And same thing with these sorts of psych psychological capabilities, the sort of um, suppressed feelings of guilt or to forgive yourself, like it seems like that's sort of what I thought mm -hmm. this question over here was getting mm -hmm. at, that, yeah, so having the courage to engage in self-forgiveness is, is a positive thing, again, indexed to a certain set of already substantive moral judgments. And so, Correct. And so I guess my question is, is that with Kant, you know, the, the substantive moral judgments coming from something like the categorical imperative based on the nature of agency or something like that, is where is there is there a substantive is there is there a grounding for substantive judgments or is it basically sort of is it or or how can we distinguish yeah. between good nimbleness and bad nimbleness? Mm -hmm. How can we distinguish between good self forgiveness and bad self forgiveness? Great. on the Stoic view. All of ancient e this is sort of the question of ancient versus modern ethics. Ancient yeah. ethics is about uh, we'll call it virtue ethics. And there's no criterion that easily bubbles up of what's morally, uh, for determining moral right and wrong. They're not, they do not formulate a criterion. So there's no deontological formula, there's no utilitarian formula, there's no, you know, natural law kind of comes out of this tradition. 
Um, and, you know, and Kant has a version of it called the formula of the law of nature, but the formula of the law of nature really isn't in nature. That's just called that. It's really your reason um, and some version of how you get from respecting persons as rational and reasonable beings as ends in themselves from a formula of universal law is another story. But the, the rationality that was infusing the whole cosmos for Kant becomes, as you say, the grounding of a principle for determining if, you, if your action's permissible or required or obligatory or the like. No ancient, as I understand it, ancient philosophers don't have that going. They're very interested in flourishing. They're interested in a, a well-lived life through virtue, and virtue is, uh, you know, the, the, the Stoics don't even give you the specific cardinal virtues that we associate with Plato or the like. It's really just virtue, <laughs> and it's reason. So they give you the, they give you a stepping stone into Kant. You know, reason is going to be supreme. Uh, because everything for the Stoics is reason. Your emotions are filled with reason. There's no other psychic stuff except the hegemony of reason. But it never converts into a principle for guiding uh, permissible, impermissible uh, right action, or as you say, indexing. So that's just a later development. It's much more to do with uh, your character. And But, you know, we... we as you say, nimble or foolhardy, what is to what are you? What are the fine ends to which you peg courage? Not really, you know. We can accuse them of conventionalism at the end of the day, if you want to, you know. Essentially. So would you, yeah. Quick follow. So would you say that the Stoics, in some sense, have less to say about this than maybe Aristotle does, where Aristotle at least seems to have the, he has the function argument, he has something like the mean, the argument from the mean and. I mean, there's a sense of, sure. like, you can, I mean, you can, he seems, it seems like Aristotle does have things to say about, like, what constitutes, like, I mean, of course, you would say, like, bad courage is not really courage at all, that sort of thing, but I guess, I mean. It's hard. Like, he has this notion of takhalon, the fine, mm -hmm. and lots of people have argued hard and strong that the fine is something independent of uh, fine and noble, you know, kalas uh, kagathos, the fine and the good. But it's not really hard. They, you know, uh, it would be hard to find a criterion of right action, I think, in ancient ethics. Mm -hmm. There are models. Mm -hmm. There are embodied models, the, frani the persons of practical wisdom. But, you know, uh, and there are specific virtues. But I think it would be hard to, to think of it in those terms. They're just not interested in that. Yes, please. Thank you for the question. Great questions. Forgiveness, yeah. So I'm kind of curious as to what it's about. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Coming from a long view, especially in positions where the the action that calls out for forgiveness is especially egregious. Yeah, as in this, yeah, war crimes. To know, you know, the language of moral repair, well, moral repair either uh, self-directed or repair, re-entry into a community after you've done the right things that will allow you to be able to re-enter that community. Um, could be punishments. Uh, it could be. Um, uh, individual reform, it could be um, acts of, you know, loving kindness and goodwill and it's, it's in community service, as we would say in our, la our language. They don't have that conversation. I mean, I'm, 
it's notable in this particular play, and there's some controversy as to whether Sen it's at Seneca's hand or not, that uh, he really is thinking about uh, a horrible deed, but in this case was act presumably bl uh, through accident. Now, there is this conversation that goes on in Trojan Women, also by him, Seneca, that essentially sort of says, uh, it's Hecuba, you know, and her son. They're going to be essentially, they're pawns to Ulysses. The it, it, war's over, but they won't let, it's, it's about youth post bellum. They will not heal these, they will not uh, do anything kind to these individuals. They throw this young kid, Astyanax, off a cliff. He's all of two or three years old, but because he might be a future Trojan warrior. You know, the, the transgressions of the sin, the sins are, go from generation to generation. In this case, and Ulysses says, I wish I could show, this is Odysseus, I wish I could show mercy, but I just can't. And so there's a case where you would think there would be some uh, willingness to forgive. These are not even the, the war actors. These, this, is, this is the civilians in a certain way, the wife of and the children of, uh, of, the, of the Trojan warriors. There's no mercy shown at all, no forgiveness of anyone related who has anything to do with the, with the enemy's war. And so they're, they're not strong on that point, you know? Can yeah, I, please. I That's my view, at least. Yeah. Is, is this just a lacuna in their, their thinking, um, or is there something about stoicism that just forbids all of this? this well, if you're a sage, you never do anything wrong. So that, you know, it, it's the problem of these over-idealized philosophies that can't figure out what to do in non-ideal conditions, right? It's a standard problem. Um, so that's part of what, you know, but what's notable, in, if you read Seneca, is that he's just a progressor, a moral progressor, as he calls an aspirant. He knows he's, I mean, how could he not? He's living under Nero, he's Nero's speechwriter, he does all these horrible things for Nero. And so he, you know, he, he, he realizes that he's made a lot of mistakes and uh, he's got to move forward. But that's just sort of like personal soliloquy almost, R reflections in an imaginary epistolary relationship he has in the letters. So, oh, my pleasure. One more? Yeah, I'll let you. Yeah, please. Um, this is going back to the three of children you're talking about. Yeah. I'm not sure if you can answer this question with the whole piece. Um, we know <clears throat> that uh, a larger quantity of adults who have developed PTSD after combat have previously experienced childhood trauma. Right. That'd be great. I wish I had answers. I don't know the research on this, um, but it, you're right. Um, but also, PTSD is a, you know has all sorts of complicated prefactors, disposing factors, and many it shows up in many, many, many different ways. Very, but but I wish I had an answer to that. I think if we, I mean, if I had one thing, I would just sort of say we need so desperately to destigmatize mental health. Uh, at all, not just in the military, I mean publicly. Um, and we draw from the public in the services, obviously. So we so, we so need that. Nancy, thank Th you. Oh, my that pleasure. terrific. Oh, uh, thank you. Stoicism in four weeks, and I'm going to appropriately change all my notes. So <laughs> don't, work, don't work too hard. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And I apologize. I did not, the room seemed very dark. I didn't realize I had my sunglasses on at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't trying to hide from you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. And thank you. What a pleasure.